ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Sam Roberts Wrestling Podcast. Introducing your host from New York, here is Sam Roberts. Look who's finally here. <laughs> Taz, what's the haps? <sighs> Not the man. Um, appreciate you having me on. Well, Thanks, I appreciate Sam. you being here. You don't do a lot of. Uh, I don't. You don't do a lot of wrestling podcasts. I do not. I, you don't do a lot of wrestling podcasts. You don't do a lot of uh, indie shows. You don't do a lot of signings. Nothing. No. Why? I um. Great question. Um, I've Just been asked it a few times though. No, but really, all kidding aside, like I, uh, it's gonna sound. I just, I don't know, I, I try to keep myself um, always, my whole career, kind of like, if I don't have to do it, I'm not going to do it. It's no disrespect on fans. I believe in the, uh, some things get oversaturated, and I don't want to be part of that oversaturation. Right. That's number one. It kind of, I think for your branding, you got to keep yourself uh, exclusive in mm-hmm. the, to a degree. And also from a um, from a podcast perspective or being a guest on people's shows, you know, uh, I'm sure you're going to get to this, but I do a plethora of programming. So I'm on the air 10 hours a week. Right. So it's like, uh, I don't, I don't want to go and talk to people more about wrestling when I could just cover it in my show. So why am I here? <laughs> that's, a, <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah, I had to figure out some way to finagle you into no, the No, I'm, I'm here because you're a good dude, and I always liked you. always got a long, you know you a long time. I respect you, and you do good shit. You've been on my show. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just, you know, it's cool that we could do stuff together. It was fun doing your show, and it's always interesting because, like, uh, a lot of times, that's the thing about your show is that it's, to me, it's much more of a radio show. It's formatted like a radio show yep. more so than a podcast. Because a lot of times, like if I'll do other shows yeah. or whatever, it's like a big time commitment. Like sure. they're like, yeah, just call into the show and you're on for like two hours. No. You're like, I've got, but like with you, it's like, no, you can stay up right after the pay per view. Yep. Twenty minutes. Give me your opinion. And in then and we're on to the next thing. On That's to the it. next thing. I got to keep it moving. Uh, it is it is definitely, to your point, structured. Uh, you being a radio guy, you get it. It's structured as a radio show because... Uh, it's handled as that because that's what it really is. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, sometimes I'll have a guest on two segments once in a while, but we got to take breaks. Um, and what happens, dude, is like when the show drops as audio on demand or a podcast, you know, we really don't edit anything out of it. So there's really not. Tomorrow, Stan. All right, goodbye. <laughs> goodbye, Jim. Jimmy Norton. That <laughs> bum. Who do you ever beat? No, but uh, so it's like, you know, we, 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 um, we drop it as is. So it's basically when I, sh- when I'm, shooting and taping audio and video it's live to tape right so there's no editing as you Isn't know a that lot the best it the is live like it is. It's just like people say absolutely they go back and listen to their i don't even listen to the stuff after it's done no, i don't either i don't either and, and and just one point i want to make about podcasting and like your, your stuff you do and some other guys do it's evergreen content yes okay my show is not evergreen okay yeah. my show is a topic-based show it's not a guest-driven show and that's another reason why it's not a podcast. And it's live with cameras and this and that, and it streams live. So, but people, I, I do have to be frank, more people listen to my podcast than listen live. But I don't have good shelf life on my shows, but we know that. We know that going in. That's kind of, CBS was cool about it, and they knew that. And that's know? why you do it every day anyway. Correct. There's new, new, then, Correct. you know, if this doesn't have shelf life, but they're watching the new one and the new Correct. one and the new one. Correct, exactly. So, yep. but you've put yourself in a position now where you have to watch <laughs> wrestling all the time. That's the tough part. Yeah, like you have to watch all of WWE's programming. Time, everything you have to kind of at least know what's going on in TNA. I do. Yes, I do. Do you yes, watch course. Impact? I watch some of it. Uh, now, as th- whenever this drops, uh, Hardys will be gone. I would assume. Yeah, I can't believe. I know. I know. We that- talked about that on my show recently a lot, and uh, yeah, it's heavy. Um, my point of mentioning Hardys is to be frank. That was one of the main only reasons why I would. I love the broken gimmick. Uh, I love the whole thing. So right. I would watch TNA only when they were doing big stuff with them. But otherwise, I really wasn't. Only because my audience mostly wants to hear about uh, WWE stuff, my particular audience. And I do cover, um, you know, sometimes Ring of Honor. And I do stuff with independent wrestling a little bit here and there. I have a segment um, where every Monday I have, uh, out of three different female wrestlers, independent wrestlers, they come on the show. We do something called In the Indies. Okay, where we have, uh, you know, like Veda Scott, I'm sure you're yeah, familiar sure, with Veda, sure, from Ring of Honor. and Deanna per- Perrazzo, yeah, like and, and also Taylor Hendricks. So yeah. they, they come, we do a rotating schedule. We kind of missed the past several weeks once the New Year started, but we'll get back on track. Point is, these girls come on and kind of update 
uh, us on on what's going on in the indies. I right. give them that platform. Plus, then you don't have to know everything that's going on in the indies. Correct. It's too much information Correct. for you. Correct. And and so people can hear from somebody else within the Taz show. Yeah. So I have like Mike Johnson from PW Insider. He comes on a show every week and gives like a kind of a scoops report or like a. I'm not a reporter, you know. I, that's why I don't, I don't consider myself part of media of the industry where yourself would be because. I've been in the game. You know, I was as a former champion and yeah. a broadcaster, you know. Well, I mean, you watch an NFL pregame show. I always think of it that way, like com- what I do compared to what you do or Austin or Jericho. or right. Like, there's a big difference. People listen to, if you're watching an, an NFL, like you listen to Joe Buck and get something different than from Troy Aikman. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Joe Absolutely. Buck has this analysis, but Troy Aikman has this experience that Absolutely. is just not replaceable. His opinion that's right. Means more because he's Be, done it. Being in the pit when you're in the huddle, you've been in the pit. Yeah. Now, it, not necessarily does it mean more. Now, I, I understand why you're saying it's it, and I appreciate informed. it. It's more formed from experience. Yes. But you do need the Joe Bucks of the world, the Sam Roberts of the world, that are going to give you a perspective. Oh, I think so. From a strong fan perspective. Yeah. Oh, you agree with that part? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we need oh, yeah. Sam Roberts. Oh, we really yeah. need Sam. Yeah. yeah. That fan perspective is key. <laughs> key. I'm just saying the wrestler perspective is important. It's important, too. too. Yeah, it's yeah, just too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sort of. That's funny. Um, <laughs> what was your, because you were talking on uh, the Siri, on our morning show on Sirius today about how right now you're as happy as you've ever been yeah but being a wrestler when were you happiest was it when you were the number one guy in ecw was it when you show up in wwe because it's such a bigger stage was it before that like when 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 is your happiest time (sighs) as an active sports entertainer i I would say uh, i was probably most happy in ecw even though it was the toughest time for me because I really put a lot of pressure on myself during that time, and I was getting a, a really strong push, and it took me a lot of years to get that push, and once I got that push, meaning before ECW, it took a lot of years, and once I got it, I didn't want to lose it, and I got very, um, uh, at times, immature, because I didn't have to handle the push, and I kind of pushed everyone out of my world in that locker room for the most part, and had a couple of guys that I confided in, I was friends with everybody else, I was at times a little bit of a douche, and some people have said that about me, and I've one of the first things I did when I got my show with CBS, and I got, actually was before my show, was the podcast with CBS, the human podcast machine, One, I kind of apologized to, 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 the, to just the whole locker room of ECW, just as a whole, like, I was a little immature, because I put a lot of pressure on myself, so as much as it was a great time in my career, yeah. probably the best as a wrestler, it was stressful. So how do you go, if you don't get along with guys, how do you go and wrestle with them? Especially in someplace like ECW, where it's way, it was way more physical yeah. than than typical you know, TV wrestling. It's business, bro. Yeah? You know, it's business. It's just, you got to be professional. Um, I've seen guys, in, especially in ECW, get into fist fights. And go and and go out there and then wrestle each other and protect each other and it's it's the code of the business. Yeah, it's the code of the boys. Um, you know, I've I've had problems with guys too, and then we go out there and do business. You know what I mean? I mean, really, we have. I mean, so it's just that's part of the game. You can't break that code. You know. Why do you isolate yourself when that's it? Like, how does that protect your push? Is it because? You don't want anybody knowing anything about you. Is it be, you just don't trust no, anybody? It was a trust thing. It was my fault. It was a trust. I'm with dude. We're going back ninety five, sure, ninety six. Sure, you yeah. know, I was. Uh, it was a lot younger. Uh, yeah, you know, it was. I was more in a. I was in a. I was nervous that I I'm on top of the mountain and I know people are trying to pull me down in a competitive way, not in a negative way. Mm-hmm. And I don't want no one to pull me down. They want your spot. Yeah. Not because they don't want you correct, to have it because correct. they want to have it. And that's how it should be. That's that's why we had a very competitive locker room. Everybody thinks CCW was like, you know, rainbows and butterflies. It was a great place, don't get me wrong, but it was an ultra, ultra competitive locker room. Mm-hmm. You know, and you gotta say something too. A lot of the guys they like to have a good time. It was it was wild. It was a frat you know feel. Uh, but I kind of was, I kind of stayed to myself and there was no knock on anybody that I lived my life and I wasn't, so maybe some of them didn't trust me because I wasn't <clears throat> doing some of the things maybe some of the guys were doing and I don't, I, I don't begrudge anyone for what they do and, and don't begrudge me for what I do. Right. You know, I kind of lived my life. I kind of stayed private and I didn't want to, you know, I just didn't want to, So you know. How did they, how did they have that? How was the ECW locker room that competitive? Was it just, that's what Paulie brings to the table? Because it's not like. You guys had million dollar paydays. Right, it's not right. like there was, you know, you had pay per view. You didn't have WrestleMania. Right. You didn't have stadium shows. Like there wasn't this thing that you were fighting for. Where it's like, if I'm the top guy, I am a megastar and never have to work again. You, you want to be on top. 
sometimes it has nothing to do with the money. Yeah. And if you're not making seven figures and you're making six or whatever, whatever the figure is, it's about being competitive. Mm -hmm. You know, so if, I, if I'm going out there, I'm trying to outperform Sabu. I'm trying to outperform Van Dam. Raven's trying to outperform me. Sam is trying to outperform, you know, uh, Raven. Uh, uh, Tommy Dream is trying to outperform, you know, uh, uh, the Eliminators. The Dudleys are trying, you know, it, it's just, it builds that. That's what you want. That's how, <laughs> you know, and Paul didn't say, go out there and compete. He didn't do that. Right. He let us just go out. We were animals. And a lot of the, <laughs> the main acts from there were very, very, very competitive. More than people, I think, talk about. When did it start occurring to and you? And there was no cutthroat shit, by the way. What do you mean? Meaning that it wasn't like we were so competitive we were trying to stab each other in the back. I, right. I can't say that about anyone. I don't know if anyone ever trying to stab me in the back in ECW, not one wrestler. And I know I've never stabbed anyone in the back. I mean, maybe some guys could tell you something different, but I, I that's not me. Uh, I, I think it was all fair uh, war games. But just a locker room full of guys tr fighting to have the best match of the night. I think so, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'll tell you what. Try and go follow a friggin' Van Damme match, okay? Right. It wasn't easy, <laughs> you know, and and I had to do that sometimes, or or be ahead of him, or or wrestle him. You know, I'm just saying, like, just using Rob as an example. You know, I mean, it, it, you know, it's like <clears throat> there was so many guys, so many of us like that. I mean, not many guys had his athletic ability, mm -hmm. but there was so many of us that had our own powers out there amongst the audience. No matter if it was a guy cutting an amazing promo or a Sandman with this crazy, awesome entrance that his entrance was so powerful, it was like, what do you do next? Or the mystique of Raven and how he just, just who he was and the character or Sabu, who was just ahead of his time from a physical standpoint, with doing crazy stuff out there. You yeah. know what I mean? There was just, you, were, you were pretty ahead of your time with the whole I MMA so. deal. Yeah, I like, appreciate it. Nobody that. was doing MMA. No, no. And no. like if you like if you introduce that now, yep. like that's something you'd be tested on. You'd be like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like yeah, well, uh, yeah, you'd get heat, yeah. and not with the talent, with with the promoters. Like when I first went to WWF at the time in mm -hmm. early two thousand, I was doing. You know, I started out for a couple of matches doing my same style I did in ECW: suplexes, submissions, joint locks, and it rapidly I had to chill out. Why? <laughs> Uh, because it wasn't uh, what I was told in a nice way was you, you're not going to have anybody that wants to work with you. I, I go, why? I'm not dangerous. Well, it looks like you're hurting people. Well, that's my job. I'm supposed to look like I'm hurting so people. So you mean like the guy? No, hold on. They were like, well, well you're, you're not even six foot. I'm like, okay, so what? Mike Tyson's not six foot and he's knocking motherfuckers out left and right. Uh -huh. <laughs> At the same time, this is, I mean, like, what does that matter? <laughs> So, so I see. So guys don't want to be the WWE guys at that time. Maybe don't want to be in the ring with a guy who's not six feet tall, who's looking like he's kicking their ass. Correct. And it wasn't the talent that was saying that. I felt the office in WWF at the time felt like, um, you know what? I don't think it's a good. This is going to create a bad vibe amongst our locker room. Now WWE, to their credit, has changed immensely with that sure. mindset. We, we you know, something like Suplex City. I, I'm la I laugh when I hear it <laughs> and the, the brilliant marketing behind it. And I love Brock and I love Paul. And and, and he, he, Brock's a friend of mine. I mean, uh, but and it's great. I'm happy for him. And all the different uh, two or five live guys or the cruiserweight stuff or the UK guy, all these different suplexing we've seen. I laugh. I've tweeted sometimes. If I did that throw, I would have been fired. And and I do it as a joke. But during my time, I mean, like you had to really be careful. I mean, you know, you had to really be careful of the way you worked. I think when the radicals came in right after me, like a week later. Uh, some of those guys had a similar style to me. That we, so I think that kind of loosened up a little bit, but they they were coming from WCW, so I had a better perception for them where I was from little old ECW. Did but they yet not... they ignored the pop, meaning the company that I got when I debuted at the yeah. Garden. So it was kind of a weird thing. Like I, That pop wasn't made by the company, and I felt like the company wanted to rebrand who this Taz guy is. I see. So they wanted that 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 vibe that Taz brings, but they wanted it to be their vibe. Correct. And and that's kind of difficult because then you have to change the thing and then oh, the yeah. people that are cheering, it doesn't work. That's why when you asked me when was the best time as for me as a wrestler, I didn't say WWE. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I said ECW. <laughs> so, like, so, yeah, because you would think if they had enough faith in you that they gave you Kurt Angle's first loss and they let you come in as Taz and it was the whole, like, you looked like ECW Taz. They changed your music and that was pretty much it. Yep. Did, I don't understand, does somebody say like, oh, there's this Taz guy and we're going to do this and maybe like Vince doesn't know what Taz is and then he sees it and changes it? Oh, no, Vince it, knows because him and I negotiated my contract. Yeah. So, so at what- I mean, Vince knew, I should say. Yeah. Sure, sure. But at what point does like, 
I, I, who says then? Who is it a surprise to uh, on what you do? Like, isn't that uh, it's something? A good, it's a good question. I think that some of, um, without naming names, because I don't want, I don't do that. I don't. I'm not and if, for if people it. are disappointed in that, sorry, but that's not my style. But a couple of, I think, agents at that time, they're no longer with the company, were very old school, and I think some of them were a little. They had a lot of influence, and I think they were turned off, and I think. When I wrestled in that actual match while I was wrestling mm -hmm. against Kurt in the garden, I don't know what happened backstage, but I got a funny feeling. A couple of people ran up to Vince while he watched it in the gorilla position huh. and said, dude, this guy is like, you know, he's going to hurt somebody. And there was one spot, and I joke about it still, and I joked about when Kurt Angle was on my show recently, we joked about it, a German suplex, I mean, if you go back and watch the match, I went to give him a German release suplex, and our timing was off a little bit. So what I did was I put Kurt back down and then re-threw him to protect him mm -hmm. and clear him. That little hiccup on that throw, I really think, was a big problem. Uh, I think that one spot, I think, turned off some folks backstage and like, uh-oh, this guy's reckless. And actually, if you look at the spot closely, yeah, it's not me being reckless. It's me seeing our timing was off because we never wrestled each other. And fixing it. And fixing it. On huh. the fly, and no one even noticing. You know wow. what I mean? It, yeah. I mean, in the audience noticing. No of one course. in the audience. No one's like, you effed up. Nobody, nobody did that. You yeah. know what I mean? So I also think the pop, and I've said this many times on my show, Sam, when I came out, and and anybody who was there, thank you, and that massive pop that I got, I, I knew as I was walking down the aisle with the towel on my head, I think I'm doomed here. Because you didn't want, like, I want to be, I want people to know who I am. I don't want this many people to know Correct. who i am because I, I knew it would be a little problem <laughs> i see now in this day and age i think it'd be different but back then it was a different a very 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 competitive locker room in wwf at that time mm -hmm. and um you know who was this guy from little old bush league ecw in a bingo hall drinking right. Heyman's kool-aid who the hell is he to come in here at Madison square garden and get this pop that's insane because i guess there still was that thing where even though ecw was not on the the scale of WWE, right. there was still that thing where in the wrestling world it was looked at as ECW was what was cool. Right. So there probably still was some competition of like, why does this ECW guy think he can hang with us? Right. Whereas now I don't think that that right. exists. I don't well, think that there is. I, I, I an think outsider you're right. I think anymore. you're completely right. I totally agree with you. Uh, but I do think the pop didn't help me. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. It was the greatest professional feeling I've ever had. Yeah. That reaction in the garden. I, I was. I, I remember hoping as I was getting ready to walk through the curtain that they would know who I was. That mm -hmm. was my biggest fear, that they wouldn't know me. You know, because I, I'm used to working in Queens at the Elks Lodge in New York, or or in Philly at the at, you know at, at the ECW Arena, Bingo Hall. Yeah. So I was just worried. Oh God, man! I hope, hope they even know who I am. Just a little pop would be nice. And then when the place exploded, when they sort of boom, 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 I'm like, oh boy. I don't think <laughs> I the didn't office. Want that much. I don't want that much. <laughs> I yeah. Didn't want that much. You got to stay too, though, dude. Like Vince and stuff. That, you know, they had seen me work already in their ring uh -huh. because when we did the invasion gimmick, it was on Raw at the Manhattan Center. The, right. Of course, I remember that. I wrestled Mikey Whipwreck, and Paul Heyman was on commentary with. Jerry Lawler and Vince. When Sabu came off the R. He fell off the R, as we <laughs> say. That's the big joke, Sabu. We, we still tease each other. But I would tease him about it. And he's like, ah, oh, I'm not you. Yeah, yeah. That, it's like, you fell off the R, bro. Yeah, he did. He fell on Team Taz off the R. Yeah. Yeah, I, I got it. it. was funny and horrible at the same time. You know uh -huh. what I mean? Like, but, but it's funny to laugh at now. I mean, I still tease him. But, um, you know, so Vince knew my work. He saw me. He saw I was doing some unique suplexes in that match. Yeah. And he you could hear his reaction on comedy. He's like, whoa, what is that? They were trying to pitch to like the nation of domination backstage yeah. doing a cut-in, not about me. And they were just and once they did that and I saw it back, I knew that they weren't they didn't care about me or ECW that much because they were doing cutaways for their stories. Was there a part of that when you guys did that uh Manhattan Center Raw? Which to me, like, I mean, I remember watching that and it was like, it was just cool. And I think Very that's what cool. the intention Very was, right? Cool, there yeah. wasn't anything bigger than nah, let's just do a cool thing. They were trying to help us and yeah. we were trying to help them. I think Paul and Vince had a little agreement. I think. Yeah, but was there any part of, of you or any of the other guys that were wrestling on that show of like, oh, but we get to wrestle a match in front of Vince McMahon? This is. <sighs> uh... Or were you guys so ECW Kool Aided up I... that it wasn't even a consideration? I was Kool Aided up. Mm -hmm. I think I think several of the guys were. Um, I it, it could have been. No one ever said that. We kind of had our own locker room. We stayed to ourselves. They wanted us to stay to ourselves. They wanted to keep us like renegades because we were, and that's kind of was the feel. Um, 
I know this, we were kind of pissed about a lot of different things after that night, you know, because even though it was an awesome platform, but we just didn't like some of the things like the commentary and some of the stuff that, that Lawler was saying, they had Lawler saying, and just, we knew he would like be anti ECW, but it was like really too far. Like really like, and so did you get legit pissed at Lawler? Um, I, I didn't. I didn't get like legit pissed like I wanted to fight him. I was pissed, right? But but you it, just used it in the again. Yeah. I so, to back to the top of this <laughs> conversation. I said I was a little immature back then. Uh-huh. So I was. I mean, I was. I was young, aggressive, and angry. And and Raven used to say to me all the time, "Dude, what? Are you, why are you so angry?" You got everything. You got a beautiful family, a home. You make a lot of money. You're on top. You're in this cool company, ECW, and you're mad. And I said, Scotty, I don't know why. <laughs> and we'd laugh. He's like, you're crazy. And yeah, I don't know why I'm angry. I, I think because Taz is supposed to be angry. Right. You know, like, so I kind of was living the gimmick a lot, too, which I think helped it. And I think, to be frank, that's the problem with some of the younger guys today. I'm a big fan of the young generation. I am, the current generation. Mm-hmm. But I do think that some of them might be playing wrestle a little bit, and you can't. You can't play wrestle. You, you kind of have to live the gimmick a little bit because that that gives it really it resonates to, to the audience you have to be like what's his name and there will be blood oh. who just walks daniel day lewis oh yeah just, yeah, method, yeah, yeah. just <laughs> method you have no, to walk dude, you around gotta, dude, you gotta feel it man yeah. you, i real that's how i was i mean, I mean yeah. look you walk in here and you're wearing orange headphones you know i think you're still kind of living the gimmick yeah that's which the is the point actually yeah. yeah you're still taz i am and that's it i mean that's who i am like on my show i mean it's it's orange and blacked out and all that stuff and you know, the, the set is and all that, and that's all my merchandise is. I mean, it, by design. That's what people, that's branding. So what was, uh, why the change from the uh, singlet to the to the jumpsuit? It wasn't a jumpsuit. Oh, that's the first thing. What was um, it? It looked like a jumpsuit. <laughs> it was not a jumpsuit. No, Sam. No, no, no. no. Mechanics outfit? No, it wasn't that <laughs> okay. either. I did not pump gas. I apologize I, for I that. Not, uh, no, a lot of people said that. I'm busting <laughs> your balls. It wasn't, though. It actually what it was, to be honest. Okay, the shirt, the top was uh, Dickies. You know Dickies, right? The, yeah. the shirt. I tweeted right? you. I have the shirt. I that's found right. it. That's right. You I did. Found I found it, it when I said thug it. In yeah, my yeah, mom's yeah. house, yeah. And so that's a Dickies shirt, yeah. and I would wear that. And the pants uh, were, and I wore my singlet, singlet underneath it just to you know, keep my body tight when I was doing suplex. I need to keep something on me to like you know, a Spanx? Uh kinda like Spanx. <laughs> no, it wasn't like or Spanx. Like just, a manly athletic just a manly Spanx, Spanx. Yeah. yes. <laughs> no, no. Uh, and the pants were actually just Mesh, they were custom made mesh, uh, like loose sweatpants, mm-hmm. like mesh, like a football jersey. And I wore wrestling boots. And the reason why that change happened, a lot of people thought that was WWE. Oh my God, they're, they're killing Taz. They're, they're making them wear that and not wear a singlet. If I had Twitter back then or Twitter was even a thing, I would have tweeted out, listen, stop it. It's not the WWE's fault. It was my idea. Mm-hmm. I went to Vince and one of the writers, I'm like, dude, I want to, I want to, I, I tore my bicep. Okay, I was out for a little while. The company took care of me, paid me, did the right thing, sent me to the right doctors. Vince reassured me, and he kept his word. I got to say, I can't say anything bad about him like other people do. Mm-hmm. When it came to injuries, I've been injured several times there. They've always taken care of me, always, uh, always. And and um, and I tore my bicep, and I had I need some downtime. And then I said to Vince when I was coming back, uh, look, I want to change my look. He goes, well, to what? And I told him. And he's like, it sounds cool. Let's let's give it a look, maybe like on a house show or something. See how it looks. We'll have a camcorder there or whatever, and we'll tape some of the matches anyway. And he, he said, that's cool if you want to wear it, but you got such good legs. You're hiding your legs. I go, I know. I just, I just, I just want to have a complete changeover. I want to keep the orange and black, but a different look. And that's how it happened. It wasn't them. I, right. I have nothing to hide. I mean, I, it was me. I just, you just wanted, wanted to change. Just to change. I, look, they didn't want that same. Taz, mm-hmm. that human suplex machine, because I wasn't called that anymore. Right, they didn't want that guy anymore. And so did you want to? And, and you probably, when you realized what was going on, you probably wanted to change some things too. Yeah, because yeah, you, you wanted to let go of the ECW correct. stuff. That's right, because I didn't want them to tarnish my in-ring legacy any more than they were doing. Right. So I'm going to WWE. Ki- mean. Correct. Yeah. I'm going to kill all that that we had there. And I'm going to, I'm going to conform and change and be creative. And I'm proud of that. So like, there are some things like when I signed with WWE that, and I talked about this recently on my show that were my intellectual property, you Mm -hmm. know, things like human suplex machine, FTW, one man crime spree, 
all of those monikers were never used for me in WWE mm-hmm. because it was my intellectual property. Right, so they're not going to they're not <laughs> going to add value to that. They didn't, yeah. right? And yeah. I didn't know that was going to happen. And, and that's uh, my agent. He's so good. <laughs> uh, so he's so talented. So uh, he's a genius, and you know who he is. So, uh, <laughs> so, so anyway, um, so that didn't work. Uh, so they went with two Z's instead of one Z. One Z was mine. T A Z was my IP. Right. You know? but, but yeah, not two Z's. Say, no problem. You can have it. We're going to make you two Z's. <laughs> okay. It's perfect. So, yeah, yeah. It's so, perfect. Yeah. So how do you make the... Uh, well, I, here's what... Did you... Was your... Because I watched an interview, a, a clip of you on YouTube yesterday, and it was it was when you were talking about uh, going to the garden and calling Paul Heyman and, oh, and yeah. doing that thing. So why was it hostile when you left ECW? Like what... Why did your relationship with Paul Heyman... Why was it not great? Ooh. <laughs> well, uh, Paul was under the impression that we came to terms and I was staying in the company and he's not wrong. Okay. He's not wrong. We, we verbally agreed. He, he we did, you know, uh, it was a lot of years ago. So I'm trying to remember it all. Sure. And Paul sure. and I are still good friends and sure. it's water on the bridge. We've right. worked it out. It's a lifetime ago. It really was. Yeah. So I'll try to remember some of it. So when I'm saying, does it match exactly what I said on that YouTube thing? Then I'm sorry, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm not lying. I'm just trying to remember exactly what happened. All, the long and short of it is, Paul thought that we uh, had an agreement, and then I kind of was reneging on the deal, the verbal. But I really felt like, because knowing some stuff that was going on, I felt like at that time he was not going to be able to do make well, to do right on that financial end of the agreement for my 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 money. Mm-hmm. Um, his heart was in the right place; he felt he would be. But and in hindsight, twenty twenty, I was right because right. it would it would I it would have been, and I just had we just had a baby and. My wife and I, and it was like it was just I I couldn't play games, and I had this opportunity. Did that, you ever did you ever miss checks from him in the past, or you just saw that's where it was going? Uh, I had missed. Um, I got to say, I, Paul owes me zero, uh, okay. no money. He's never owed me money, mm-hmm. um, never. So, and there's several guys like me he never owed money to. Mm-hmm. Um, there were a couple times where I'd have my check, and he would say he'd call me and say, "Hey, uh, wait until Friday and put your check in." Oh, come on, Paul. Bye, bye, bye. That bitch and moan. No, no, just wait. Please stop. Yeah, okay. That would happen. But um, you'd wait until Friday and then it would be cool. It would be cool. Okay. One time it wasn't cool and he fixed it right away. Okay. I mean, right away. And it, But, dude, I, there were so many other guys that had much bigger issues with that. I don't, I don't, I can't really speak on it because it didn't happen to me. Right, right. You, know I mean? you just saw uh, the he way did the right thing going. Me. He did. And then my, listen, man, when I got hurt early, dude, early in ECW, like before we really hit, like when I broke my neck in 95. Right. You know, he, he, there wasn't a lot of money in that company, dude, and I was terrified. I just came back from my honeymoon, and he said, listen to me, you, you take as long as it takes, I'm going to keep paying you. I go, Paul, you can't afford it, because I'm going to keep paying you, and he wow. did, and he did, and wow. he did, he did. And, and that was, that was, that's over a year before pay-per-view, that's, oh, that's when ECW yeah. was nothing. That's right. Uh, this time, like springtime of 1995, that's yeah. when it that happened. Yeah, and he paid me. Wow. Um, and I and I was making pretty good money, and it wasn't a contract; it was a handshake. You know, and he kept good on it, and the fucking guy paid me. That's amazing. You know, so I, I stayed loyal to him for a long time after that. You know. So, uh, so how do you end up in a commentary position? I remember. I think when I first started seeing you was when uh, they were doing the Sunday Night Heat show out of the restaurant. It happened a little bit before that. What happened uh-huh. was uh. I was in an angle with Jerry Lawler. Right. Um, Didn't you get a candy jar smashed over your head? Or, that or? was a little bit. This this was before that. Okay. What happened was I went. This was in the garden. In the garden on our live Raw, and I had they had me cut a promo on Jr. because I had wrestled on a pay per view. I I don't know why I keep thinking it was fully loaded in Dallas. I think that's where it was. I'm probably wrong. Bad with towns. And I think I wrestled Al Snow. I think that's who it was. I won the match, but I cheated. I was a heel, of course. Why wouldn't you cheat to win? That's what you're supposed to do. And uh, JR, good old JR, my man, while I was going through the curtain, he said, oh, that Taz, whatever he said, he's a cheating bastard. He didn't say that. But whatever he said, like he, he buried me, which he should. I, I was right, a heel. you know. Guy. So I had the idea of, God, let me play off of this. Mm-hmm. And I went to the writers, and then we went to Vince together, JR, and said, look, I want to I wanna go at JR over this. I want to be pissed. And Vince's like, I like it. It's cool. Let's do it. You can pull this off. No problem. And and they didn't want to write my promo. They wanted me just to wing it, which I was begging them always to let me just wing promos. That's amazing. They did let me wing it, and it worked. And that's the promo where I begged, was begging Jerry, hit me, hit me, hit me. And then Jerry Lawler got up 
I was right next to JR. JR wanted to hit me because I made a very disrespectful comment uh-huh. on a microphone in, in the garden on Raw. And I, and I said what I said to JR, which it, I cringe saying, thinking of the line. What was it? I, I, you know, and JR and I are good friends, so he knows it was just character. Character. Um, I said, I'd love to smack you across your face, but God already beat me to it. That's tough. It was tough. And the whole place in my hometown was like, you mother. But I love, I love, when, a bad, I love yeah. when a bad guy acts like a bad yeah, guy that's says right. something that's how, vile. I wasn't trying to be cool. Right. And that's when, that's, 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 that's how bad guys need to be. Yeah. You don't have to care about being cool. Right. You know what I mean? Ivan Koloff, who just recently passed away, a legend, this was a guy who was a heel the bulk of his career, and he went out there. He wasn't trying to be cool. He was a bad motherfucker mm-hmm. all the time. We're cool in the language, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah, he, he was just bad all the time. He yeah. wasn't trying to be cool. He was an ass kicker, bad guy. Cheating bad guy, nasty, all this dirty Russian, all this stuff. Well, look, I, I, my thing was I had to be a heel. I'm in my hometown. I got to turn him. And and I said that line to JR, and he got pissed, and the whole place was like, oh, man, hit him, JR. I'm like, you want to hit me, right, JR? You want to hit me? And I got in his face, hit me, hit me, at the announce desk. And that and they shot it so perfectly. Hit me! And once I crescendoed up, and we didn't even really plan it. Mm-hmm. Like, we knew what we were going to do, but King winged it. I winged it. JR winged it. And the production truck winged it, and all of a sudden, King just drills me. Around JR punches me. I take a bump and the place goes berserk. Right. And then I go a big pull apart. I go after King. He goes after me. They we they we can't get at each other. There's an angle. Yeah. So then we got into this angle, me and Lawler, and that's what led to me going into commentary. Because I jumped and beat him up and then I sat in with Michael Cole. Were you okay doing an angle with Jerry Lawler coming from a guy who's like super competitive, like an ECW, I want to be the top guy. And now like an angle with Jerry Lawler, great angle, mm. but it's not gonna it's not going to be a world title match. It's not going to be, you yes, know what I'm saying? Yes, my friend, but there's one thing you're missing. Tell me. I'm in an angle with a guy who's a baby face. Yes. And has the power of a mic for two hours as a commentator. So it becomes this all-encompassing. Yes, sir. Gotcha. So, gotcha. So gotcha. it helps me because he's going to talk about his angle when due time. Right. So it helps me because I'm with a guy who's got a full mic. Right. He's got a platform. Right. That so makes sense. it helps. Yes. You know, so that that's, that's why I was cool with it. Uh-huh. And... I didn't know it was going to morph to what it morphed into. So when I, I jumped uh, Lawler, I keep thinking it was Louisville. We were in Louisville doing a SmackDown. I think I jumped him early in the show. And then I sat in. They wanted me to sit in for one match, one segment with Michael Cole. Mm-hmm. I was terrified, right? So I said to Cole, I said, listen, man, I don't know what I'm doing. He goes, oh, just, I'll get you through it, man. Don't worry about it. And we worked on some things. He goes, just, just bury Lawler. That's your job. Be a heel. Bury the guys in the ring, whatever. And I did that. And then, I, you know, after I got done, you know, they, they told me before time, they said, you'll be told in your headset when to leave after the match. And the match ended. I did my thing. I was, thank God it was over. And I get up to leave. And then, like, I think Cole said to me, no, stay. Wait till they tell you. And then next I know they're playing music for the next match to start. <laughs> and I think it was Kevin Dunn or somebody said, just stay there. Just stay there. Call the next one. We're having a problem or something. Just, just stay out there. We're waiting for King. King was supposed to come back behind me and jump me and take back the seat. Yeah. Dude, they kept me out there for a couple of segments. I didn't realize this at the time. They were like <laughs> auditioning me. So I didn't know that. And I was like, uh, I was nervous. And then when I came through the curtain, Vince was like, hey, man, you did a really good job. You know, and I go, thanks. I go, I hate it. He goes, you hate it. He goes, that's your future. I go, no, I don't want to do this. And I laughed. He goes, all right, we'll see. And and then uh, it had to be like two weeks later, I get a call like on, I just came back from a house show. Uh, I was getting ready to go on a house show loop. Uh-huh. And it was like a Thursday. And I get a call from Kevin Dunn. And it's like, hey, uh, what are you doing this weekend? I go, oh, I'm working, uh, you know, I'm working a house show loop in uh, Fresno in California, you know, wherever it was. And he goes, uh, you want to go to the UK? I go, excuse me? He goes, uh, yeah, no, uh, Lawler can't make the trip. It was like, they were doing like different, two different tours. Yeah, sure. And going to UK and they're, they're doing, we're doing the pay-per-view and um, Lawler can't make it and we need someone to sit with JR to do color for, I go, that's three hours or whatever it was. He goes, yeah. He goes, I go, I, Kevin, I can't, I can't, I can't. Don't worry about JR. We'll prep with you. He'll get you through it. Ba ba ba. And I was like, oh my God. Taz is a great opportunity, but I don't want to do this, Kevin. No, no, it's a great opportunity. Just just trust me. Okay. <laughs> I got no choice. <laughs> so they take me off the house chalupe. They send me out there. 
I, I was terrified, right? Yeah. I had to sit up there that long with a legend like JR. And JR, God, man, bless his heart. He was awesome. He sat me for, for the show for like an hour, dude. Just went over everything with me. and Especially since JR and Jerry Lawler are like Monsoon and Heenan. Yeah. Like that's what yeah, man. Yeah. So I was like, damn, you know? And JR really walked me through that whole show. I'll never forget it. The show ended. It was a really good show. I don't remember the name of the pay-per-view. It was, it was in like, it was in either, um... And it wasn't in London. It was Manchester, maybe. And it was a really good pay-per-view. And I remember um, walking after the show and uh, walking back to the locker room. I was by myself, and I turned the corner. down Coming down the hallway was, coincidentally enough, <laughs> Vince McMahon and Kevin Dunn. <laughs> uh, and just me walking at them. And they both looked at me, and they stopped me. And they go, hey, you were outstanding tonight. You did a great job. That was not easy. I go, no. And I put all the shine on JR. I go, no, JR is like, no, we know how great JR is, of course. But I go, no, he got me through that. And they were like, no, 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 you you know, we need to talk. You, you're doing great. I go, oh, okay. I, I really don't want to do this, guys. No, but yeah, we think we think we need you there, though. We think it's good for you. I'm like, okay. Then what are you asking me for? Like, <laughs> you know, I never wanted to do it. I didn't want to be a commentator. Right. But then once I started doing it, it was very hard. And and then I got I'm very competitive, like I said. So yeah. I saw how hard and it, it became was. this new thing. Yeah, yeah. My like, wife was like, "Dude, you need to keep doing this because you're gonna have a, f a future." And that's why you. And then you ventured into radio after that. After that, because of course. you're like, I can take this skill easy. set and broadcasting and make Absolutely. it something that's not just wrestling. Absolutely, that was the it was an easy natural segue for me. It yeah. really was, to be honest with you, to go into radio uh, was. And I always had a passion for radio. I've been trying to get in radio for over ten years. Oh, I know. You know, so I, I told the story on your show here with you and Jimmy. You know, I, I mean, oh, I mean, however long Sirius is here, but when Stern came, you know, I was saying that. I tried to get on. Me and Michael Cole were trying to get a show here. We were yeah. doing radio. You know, yeah. It was a long time ago. Plugged away at different shows with CBS. I mean, it was a lot. A long time. I was surprised uh, TNA was not your happiest as a... As a professional. Well, honestly, dude, man, like there were there was a early goings in, in TNA. I had a lot of fun, man. I, mm -hmm. One of the best things was meeting a lot of people at TNA, like Mike Tanay, who become one of my best friends. I love Mike. I love working with Mike. I miss Mike. I miss working with Mike. I mean, truly, just a good friend, you know. I had I had a lot of fun there working. I I had there was a lot of times for a lot of yeah. I was there like six seven years, whatever yeah. it was. And I got to be honest, only like the last oh, year and a half, it got like, you know, the, the infrastructure sucked and business money, money, cash flow. They had money, but mm -hmm. they had no cash flow. So that was a little bit annoying. And um, that's why I had to get out of there. Yeah. But I got to say, I can't sit here and say my TNA run sucked. I had, I had a lot yeah, of fun working there. I did. Yeah, and it seemed like you did. I mean, I did for I a did. guy like you too. I mean, just to just to be able to go out and do a show like that where there's kind of freedom, you can go, you can have fun, oh, you can commentate, you nice. can yeah. So I wasn't micromanaged. Just go and be Taz yeah. and, and do the show. And sometimes I it could be better than I was, and I had a police myself at times. Where with WWE, it was at that time you, the announcers were very micromanaged. Where, and then I segue into you know going to a place where. You have creative freedom to just right. be smart, stay in a story. And, and you know, know, and policing yourself is a skill set that's super valuable. Absolutely. Like that's something you that absolutely you have to learn how to do. Absolutely. Because at first I was like, oh, this is the Wild Wild West. This is great. And then I had to back myself up a little bit. Right. You know? Right. I was it was I was new to me because it was like, wow, I I just said something that no one said, dude, don't say that. Wrong thing to say. You know, <laughs> let's go this way. You know, I was like, I didn't have that there. You know, so it was I had a lot of fun at TNA. It was the bulk, the bulk of my time. I did. Well, I want everybody to go to TazShow.com. Taz does a great uh, show. It's, a, it's, a, it's a streaming media yes, is what sir, it is. Please. So someone very intelligent told me that's what it's called. It's yeah. streaming media. <laughs> uh, and it's on every day, and it's, uh, it's a lot of work. It's a lot so, of work. You know better than me. You know yeah. as well as me, I should say. Yeah, it's yeah. a ton of work. <laughs> so uh, you can watch and listen to Taz Show every day at TazShow.com, at Official Taz on Twitter. And you can come back here. On, on this show anytime man thank you brother anytime this was fun i'm glad you did it i appreciate it and and you know you've been on my show and you're gonna be on my show again and yeah i'd love to i would love to keep doing things together for sure i mean definitely um you know we probably have a lot of the same fans that listen to your I podcast so. your wrestling podcast or listen to you and jimmy on mm -hmm. your regular daily show as a and in conjunction with people who listen to my show so definitely uh, and maybe there's some different fans maybe there's some fans crossover bring them cross, over crossover as we call it crossover Venn diagram yes crossover jones as i would say <laughs> that's you know? it. big into the jones you know <laughs> that's the deal bro i appreciate it man all right taz thanks a lot man thank you